All right, in the uh, in the seventies, early eighties, I think it was, there was an ad campaign on TV in which Seven uh, Up branded themselves as the Uncola. Y'all remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would imagine most folks here probably do. The announcer would explain how regular colas came from the cola nut, but 7-Up came from an uncola nut, a lemon and a lime. Okay? And then he would then pour some into an ice-filled glass, and it, it would sparkle and fizz, and, and he'd say something along the lines of, crisp and clean and no caffeine. Never had it, never will. And then he would laugh, and, and, and his laugh uh, was, was just as much a part of that ad campaign than everything, because, because the gentleman who did all of this uh, was, was, had, had, had a very thick Caribbean bass voice and accent. These ads were quite effective. They helped people understand that in the soft drink wars, 7-Up, stood alone, apart from the rest. There was nothing else like it except maybe Sprite, okay? Still, it was a great campaign. The idea of being the Uncola resonated with a large number of people. In 1 Corinthians, Paul represents or presents God's wisdom. I suppose you could say God's wisdom is the unwisdom as a kind of wisdom that is functionally opposite of traditional wisdom. Throughout the first chapter, he speaks rather dismissively of wisdom. God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. He said that in, in chapter 1, verse 20. In 121, he said, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. And then he said in, in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, that, that his message was not delivered with human wisdom. However, in saying these things, he's not dismissing the idea of wisdom altogether. He's dismissing the world's idea of wisdom, specifically the various schools of of philosophical thought that the Greeks loved to listen to. And though <clears throat> all of these various philosophies contained, some of them, brilliant ideas as well as bits and, and pieces of truth, none of them offered the truth, God's truth. And Paul is saying that the philosophy of this world can't can't bring you into an accurate understanding of the nature of God, the human condition, and God's plan of redemption. The fullness of truth can be found only in the person of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just some kind of a colorful character from ancient mythology. He was a flesh and blood human who walked among us and lived among us. And so Paul isn't dismissing the idea of wisdom. He's just dismissing wisdom as it had been presented thus far in popular culture. He endorses instead a God brand of wisdom. What you could call an unwisdom, I suppose. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, he says this in, in verses 6 and 7. However, we do speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rules of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. So what is God's wisdom? Well, it can be heard in the message of the cross, the foundational facts of the gospel presentation. Paul sums up this, this entire essential message 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we'll get to here much later, but I want to read it tonight. Chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. It says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The fact that Jesus died on the cross and was raised on the third day proves that he was who he claimed to be. He conquered death, which makes him unique among the philosophers and the gurus who claim to teach the truth. Jesus didn't claim to merely know the truth or teach the truth. He claimed to be the truth. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God's wisdom, that is everything we need to know about living, can be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about a relationship with a church. I'm not talking about church membership at all though a good church can certainly help you along the way. But I'm talking about a personal, outside these four walls relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A relationship where he walks with you and talks with you and abides with you just as you abide with him. I I find it interesting that, that Paul refers to God's wisdom back in this verse the, the, the message of the cross of Christ as a mystery that is hidden. But yet it's now being revealed. Why does he call it a mystery? Why is it hidden? Well, it's a mystery because God's eternal purpose for salvation for all people isn't something that just jumps out at you from the pages of the Old Testament. In other words, you don't really see it until you know to look for it. How many of you remember the show Murder, She Wrote? A lot of you remember that one, probably watched it some. My grandma liked that show. Not saying y'all are old. Not at all what I'm saying. She didn't watch a lot of it, but she did watch it. Her two main shows, the two main things that she watched, and I've talked to you about this before, I've said this before, were Billy Graham, when Billy Graham had a crusade on, in any show that had animals in it. Wild Kingdom, any Disney show that had animals in it. If if it had animals in it, my grandma watched it, and Billy Graham. But she also would occasionally watch Murder, She Wrote. It, it, it It was a successful who done it type of show with very effective writing in it you watch the show without any idea who the villain was the clues kept piling up but nothing was really adding up and then in the final scene angela lansbury identified the guilty party and suddenly all the elements would kind of fall into place and it all then it made sense. And now you could see the culprit's motives in, in every action that they had taken throughout that show. That is, to some extent, how God's plan of redemption works in the Old Testament. When you know about Jesus, Isaiah 53 suddenly makes sense. Jeremiah 31 suddenly makes sense, and other passages certainly then make sense. So in that sense, yes, the gospel is a mystery. It's been hidden in the past, and scholars and teachers and rabbis and priests didn't fully understand this mystery in the past. But now everyone who wants to know can know. It's not a secret anymore. Everyone can experience the fullness of this mystery in their day-to-day lives as they experience a personal relationship with God 
through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm saying that the mystery has been revealed. Spoiler alert here. God's chosen Messiah was the rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus. That's it. Everything you need to know about life, everything you could ever need in order to effectively live your life can be found in your relationship with Christ. Jesus is all you need. It comes down to him and nothing more. That's why Paul said in today's text, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, For I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus is all anybody needs. While the wisdom of the world gives you, gives you all these hoops that you have to jump through, God's unwisdom couldn't be simpler. The fullness of life is found in a relationship with Christ. And so tonight, as we look more closely at this second chapter of 1 Corinthians, I want us to consider three aspects or three outcomes of God's wisdom at work in our lives. Everything you need to live this life can be found in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he is the fullness of God's wisdom. So here are three ways that wisdom of God makes a difference in your life. The first thing that I want you to see is that God's wisdom brings with it a life of power. Paul mentions this idea of power more than once. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians Actually, back in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, or chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. And then in verse, tw or, or, yeah, verse 24 of chapter 1, he said, Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. And then in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, My speech and my proclamation were not the persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. All throughout Scripture, power is promised to those who surrender their lives to the will of God. Isaiah 40, verse 29 through 31 says, He gives strength to the weary and strengthens the powerless. Youth may faint and grow weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on, ings, on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Some of Jesus' final words to his followers were about having a power-filled life. In Acts 1.8, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Apostle Paul constantly talked about God's power. In Ephesians 3.20, he said, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Last week, I quoted William Barclay, and, and, and I think it's worth hearing again. He said, the gospel was and is power. Power to conquer self. Power to master circumstances. Power to go on living when life is unlivable. Power to be a Christian when being a Christian looks impossible. It's important. Because in order to live this life that we're in, we need God's power. And you'll soon discover that neither the ancient philosophers nor their contemporary counterparts can offer much in the way of help beyond a meme here and there that they post online. That's because while the world's philosophy 
can present to you all these wonderful ideas, it cannot connect you to the much needed source of power. And that's precisely what the gospel does for us. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. I'm not telling you all anything you don't know there, okay? That was free. Didn't cost you any extra, okay? And, and as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, you become then a new creation with a new nature and a new potential for God's power to come alive inside of each one of us. What kind of power? Well, the power to change, the power to conquer sin, to kick bad habits, to take control of your thought life, to abandon the emotional baggage that you tend to carry around with you everywhere that you go. Through your relationship with Jesus Christ, you have access to the power of God. The wisdom of God brings, it a, brings with it a life of power. Secondly, I want you to see that the wisdom of God brings with it a life of promise. There's one little phrase in verse 7 that's easy to overlook. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 7. It says, on the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory, for our glory. You know, I read that and I think, no, Lord, it's not for my glory. It's for your glory. And if God were to respond to me directly, he might say again, as he said in his word, no, it's for your glory, the glory of my people. The revivalist preacher, Jonathan Edwards, often said that God's plan of redemption, the whole point of the universe and the entire purpose for all creation was to prepare the church to be the bride of Christ, to take this group of misfits and rebels and sinners and make them into something beautiful and lovely and pure. As a follower of Christ, you're a part of that group and a part of that plan, and he wants to make you, each of us, to be exactly like Jesus. This is where the gospel of Christ stands in great contrast to the wisdom of the world. The, the world's wisdom is kind of a mishmash of life is rotten and then you die. You may as well enjoy yourself as much as you can now or not. Maybe instead you need to reject every comfort the world can offer because what difference is it going to make anyway? We're all going to die and after that, there's nothing. But the gospel of Christ says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, verse 9, But as it is written, What eye did not see, and ear did not hear, and what never entered the human mind, God prepared this for those who love him. He's talking about heaven here. But I think he's talking about more than heaven here as well. Because he's talking about the culmination of of all history into God's eternal now, what's going on right now. So yes, he's talking about heaven, something that we're going to experience in the future, but he's talking about the life that we're living in this moment right now in history. He's saying that it's, that it's beyond our ability to imagine all that God has prepared for his people, for you right here on earth. Yes, we can go through trials and tribulations and heartaches and persecutions and all kinds of setbacks. And yet, in the midst of it all, God continues to pour out all manner of blessings into our lives. Your life has been marked with a promise. A promise that you will experience joy and peace and love and purpose and meaning and abundance. A promise that you will spend all eternity in heaven and be you reunited with your loved ones. A promise that you will be made perfect in the image of Jesus Christ and will be with him forever. God's wisdom 
brings with it a life of promise. And thirdly, I want you to see that the wisdom of God brings with it a life filled with God's presence. Paul says something that, that may be hard to imagine in verse 16, at the very end. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. It says, but we have the mind of Christ. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Can we actually learn to think as Jesus would think? To view the world as he views the world? To see our circumstances from his perspective? Is that possible? Yeah, I think it is. And here's why. Because we have his presence with us. Always. He is with us. And the more time we spend in his presence, acknowledging his presence, the more we become like him. Just like two lifelong friends who, who can tell what the other one is thinking or what the other one is about to say. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you begin to think like Jesus. And of course, spending time with Jesus means spending time in his word. If you want to develop the mind of Christ, you have to spend time in the word, in the gospels. We have the mind of Christ because we have the presence of Christ every day in our lives. And we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. This is why Paul says in verses 12 and 13, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. This happens, as I mentioned before, because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us. We have God's Spirit living in our spirit, and we can experience His presence all throughout the day. And that's important because we need his presence more than ever. A survey conducted by Cigna, who is a health insurer, found that more than half of Americans, 54%, feel alone and isolated at least some of the time with those in the ages of 18 to 37 being the loneliest in all the demographics. Douglas Nemesek, Cigna's chief medical officer for behavioral health, said that loneliness has become an epidemic. It has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day making loneliness even more dangerous than obesity. Former Surgeon General V.H. Murphy said that during his years of caring for patients, the most common pathology he saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. And he agreed, loneliness is a growing health epidemic. He said, we live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. This is why the promise of God's presence is so important to us today, because it means that we are never alone. Throughout scripture, we are told that we can rely on the assurance of God's presence in our lives, no matter what happens. 
Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And among the last words that Jesus ever spoke to his followers included the promise of his presence. In Matthew 28, 20, he said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That means that we will never be alone. God is always near to you He's as near as your next breath. He's never further away than the next word that you speak. The wisdom of God brings with it a life filled with God's presence. Just like the lemon and the lime combined to create a new kind of soft drink that the soft drink industry had not previously conceived. It became the Uncola. The simple story of a small town Jewish rabbi that became the source of a new kind of wisdom beyond the world's ability to imagine. It's the unwisdom, the opposite of what the world expects. The novelist Nicholas Mosley once wrote about what he calls the most taboo topic that you can write about these days. What's the topic? Politics, race, Sexuality? No. He said the most taboo topic is to talk about life as if it had any meaning at all. The wisdom of the world, when you follow the progression to its logical conclusion, is that life is random and meaningless. It's, it's cheap and insignificant. The message that God has for his people is just the opposite. The unwisdom of God doesn't try to explain away the human condition or pretend that sin isn't a sin or that life isn't hard and that sometimes it's filled with pain. Instead, the unwisdom of God gives life new meaning, a meaning found in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything you need to know about life is found in your relationship with him. Everything you need in order to live your life is found in your relationship with Christ. His power is the power that each of us needs. His promise is the promise to live for. His presence is the presence that fills your life each and every day so that you are never alone. We need to embrace Jesus and in doing so, embrace the wisdom of God. Take out your prayer sheets, if you would.